moment. The last session I was in, everyone had to do a moment of silence and breathing. And I was sort of, I was sort of thinking that we should do that at the beginning of every session. But the lovely, peaceful music, I think, is enough for just a moment of silence before we talk about this really important issue. I'm so delighted that you're both here. Uh, the power and the potential of the law, as I was just saying, is something I think that is just gaining momentum in recent years. It's quite a new thing. So I just want to hear from you both why you've decided to dedicate really your lives to it, because you obviously see the potential in mm. it. So thank you, and it's lovely, lovely to be here. So at Clan Earth, you know, our, our theory of change is essentially that the law is an incredibly important tool to accelerate the radical change we need for people and planet and to really get us to those positive tipping points faster. And uh, we work across the whole life cycle of the law. So we advocate for the right legislation, because of course, if you get the right laws in place, you change the rules of the game. We use strategic litigation to hold governments and corporates to account on their climate and environmental commitments and really try and set precedent. And we also train lawyers, prosecutors, judges, and work with community groups and indigenous peoples to enable and support them to use the law to defend their environment and, and their rights. And I think, you know, fundamentally, what is it all driving at? It's driving at a mindset change that we all need to get to, whereby we're reconceptualizing value, where every time someone's making a decision, they're not just thinking about the bottom line, what's the cheapest thing on the shelf, what's the best return, short-term return for shareholders. They're factoring the environment and the planet into each and every decision, and that's really what we're driving at. Thank you very much, Hannah. It's lovely to be here. Uh, Laura mentioned radical change through law, and you mentioned, Hannah, that this is quite a new thing, but actually not, because law is everything. Um, in a democratic state, law is the spinal cord that sustains and shapes the society. How we buy, how, how we sell, how we lend, how we borrow, how we vote, how we get married, all is ruled by law. So you have the, um, the norms that will guide in respect of what you can or you cannot do, what you must do and what are the consequences of that. But you also have, as Laura said, the, the, the norms that will nudge certain behaviors, incentivize certain behaviors. Then you also have the norms that will chase you in case you do not comply with the law. Klein Earth and Pogus Good Head, we are working mostly on the uh, third aspect that I mentioned. So um, how can the law be followed and how we can pursue those that don't do that. But law in itself is everywhere. And considering the radical change that we need, um, that has to be in depth, but also fast, we will have to change the way that we consume, that we get in relations, business, economic, and social. We will need a fast and in-depth change also in law. It's really interesting, this new and old thing. We're going to stick with that then, because what you're saying is, I mean, the situation we find ourselves in, getting worse, climate change, of course, that is new. And the laws that you're using aren't new laws. You're using existing laws, but to that purpose. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, sometimes we are adv actually advocating for new laws. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one good example of a law that will have a really Im you know, important impact is the, is the EU deforestation regulation, for example, which we work very closely on in terms of advocacy and ensuring it was ambitious enough. And that, when it's implemented, will ensure that anything that is sold in the EU, the person selling it has to be absolutely clear that it is not involved in any way across its entire supply chain with deforestation. And so we are having all the time new laws coming on board that you know, are, we're, are driving and addressing these problems that we face in terms of how humans interact with our natural environment, with the planet. But you're right, it's all, you know, in terms of the old laws, it's how do we now, in the context of a climate and environmental crisis, how do you interpret existing laws? And so we've got a case at Clan Earth um, against the board of directors of Shell. So the directors themselves, on, on the basis of the UK Companies Act 2008, and essentially saying that it is their legal responsibility, their fiduciary duty, essentially to manage the organization, the long-term commercial viability 
responsibility of the organization, they need to be managing climate risk. They need to be leaning into the transition and thinking about what the climate will do to their long-term profitability. Now, interestingly, that, that case, which is really about the role of, you know, how you manage an organization, how you think about risk, that has been refused permission at the first stage. But it is an idea, this idea of fiduciary duties incorporating management of climate and biodiversity risk, that will come. It's a matter of time. And it's essentially how do we, how do we use these, these laws and precedents to really affect that change. Just before I come to you, who refused it? That's clear. Ah, so it was, the, so it was uh, it, by the judge in the high court, right. but we're appealing that judgment. And, it's, and in, even I think it's, you know, it's an argument that is going to be made in multiple different jurisdictions that essentially, if you're looking at the long-term sustainability of your company, you cannot discount the climate risk. And, and climate risk encompasses uh, three aspects. Um, it's the physical risk of rising sea levels or extreme weather events that could damage your investments, your infrastructure. It's the, reg it's the transitional risk. So if suddenly a government says, right, no more fossil fuels, but you've invested lots in fossil fuels, you're wasting that, you've stranded those assets, you've wasted that money. And the third is the risk of litigation. And so these are all risks that people who are running an organization need to be aware of, they need to be disclosing, they need to be managing. Okay. I, I mentioned that you're working on this in very significant case, and I don't know if people know about it, it's become very well known, the Mariana Dam case. Just explain what's happening there before we, you know, it's really interesting to hear from you both these examples, just makes it clear how this works or how it doesn't. Sure, it's a good opportunity. You started by asking about our purpose, which we absolutely ignored because we we're talking about law, but this is related to that. I'm Brazilian and for me is, is a privilege to be defending the rights of the, the Brazilian clients that we represent in, the, in this litigation. So I don't know if you all remember of all of you know, but around eight years ago, it was 5 November 2015, the Mariana Dam collapsed in this municipality of Mariana in the Minas Gerais state in Brazil. The dam collapsed, liberating 50 million cubic meters of toxic waste that travel through 600 kilometers. The numbers mean nothing, but I will give you some comparisons. In terms of volume, it was the same volume of 48 Empire State buildings or 20,000 Olympic pools of to toxic waste. In terms of travel size, that the, the mud travel through the Rio do Sea and other water sources, it would be the length of Portugal or from London to Edinburgh until it reached the ocean. We represent 620,000 individuals around 10,000 uh, indigenous people, businesses, and 50 municipalities in three states, against BHP, the Anglo-American company, and most recently, the Valley, the Brazilian mining company, was also uh, um, joined as a defendant for this case. In this case, we are claiming the damage that our clients suffered as a consequence of this disaster. So we have the obvious, so people that lost their homes because it was just flooded through, um, uh, washed out when the mud was liberated, but also municipalities that lost tax revenue, business that, that, that lost revenues, indigenous people that lost their right to, to worship because the river, the Hildos River, is a god in their culture. Um, what is interesting about this case is that the disaster happened in Brazil, but we are litigating in English courts using Brazilian law. And why it's relevant? Because there is power in saying to multinational corporations that they are liable where their headquarters is, where their board of director is, where their commander sentry is, irrespective of where they cause the damage. I was talking about purpose. This is mine. For, as someone that, who's coming from Global South, that had the privilege to study with scholarships in Brazil, in the UK, in France, to have the ability to bring the voice of Brazilian people and even more powerful using Brazilian le legislation to do so. So before, I'd love your reflections mm. on it, but, but how is it going? 
it's going well. <laughs> After, I mean, this uh, case is a roller coaster. I will tell you that um, at the beginning we had like the, our first decision on this was um, pretty pretty bad, but we overturned it. It was uh, ruled as abusive process and it was struck as a, um, a meritorious claim. But we appealed on that and we reopened the, the case. Recently, I would say six months, six months ago, the jurisdiction was established, so the English courts uh, ruled that they are um, competent to hear the case. And there is a marriage, uh, this, sorry, a marriage trial is scheduled for next October. And we are also uh, engaging with them in respect of uh, assessing damage, client quantification, damage quantification, and as well as discovery. So we have now the opportunity to receive documents.